And it's to the insect class. The insect class. It's the insect class it is. And that's because someone said they actually missed the singing. Seriously. Actually, one of the people who used to complain about the singing said they missed the singing. <laughs> so, the insect class. Mm, well, it's for the 4th of January. 2023, so technically after the year of the cruiser into the year of technology, so I can get away with doing the insect class, even though I would argue that with six inch guns, there is an argument for them being a light cruiser. It's an argument. It's a terrible argument, and we I'll defeat it in about five seconds, but there's an argument because they have six inch guns. As I've said in several videos so far, I'm going to keep saying because I'm basically doing the uh, Naval History Live channel version of what Wikipedia does, where they stick the banners up at the front. Thank you for all your support. I have big plans for this year. I have big plans for the next few years. I have plans for about the next five years, and I'm going to be working on plans for next year after, for at least another two years this year, so I, I, I plan to have about seven years mapped out, six years mapped out by the end of 2023, so I can keep it going definitely to 2030 with working out what the things are going to be. My theory being that by the time we get to 2030, technology, etc., or things might have changed enough that I have to change mediums. But please note, I'm not considering ending the channel at that point, or ending doing this sort of thing. But I'm thinking I might have to change menus. We might all be 3D classes. You never know. The metaverse might have worked and I might be doing this on Facebook with the metaverse in a... a library sort of style scenario where everyone is sitting in sort of an auditorium. And you know, everyone sort of 3D models of themselves. And there's... Like, you know, full lecture theatre board behind me, maybe a chalkboard that I can magically make all my drawings appear perfectly on. I always prefer chalk to whiteboards. I always do. Give me a nice roll of chalkboard. I can do great things on that. I can do artistry in chalk. Do not ask me why. In no other medium can I actually draw worth a hoot. But chalk I can do quite well. And those could be rolling around and I could... You know, do all the you know discussions. It, it'll be amazing. And there'll be books all around the wall. I'll be able to flick a book like that, and everyone will have a copy of the book I'm reading from or discussing in front of them, so they can flick through it themselves while I'm reading. It'll be amazing. I doubt that'll happen, but you know that, that that's just basically why I'm not planning beyond 2030. I'm I, I, I'm planning on sort of 2029, 2030, having it at the end there, and carrying on if the, the channel, hopefully, but also working out what I'm going to be doing with the channel at that point, and what mediums I'm going to be using, etc. Mm-hmm. And, of course, there are plans for books this year, for self-publishing books, which is going to be interesting and is another way to grow the public-facing public facing history. And I do want to know, because it's not... Let's put it this way. It's not without cost. Picking different things. Kindle is fairly effective, but other means of e-readers, if you have strong preferences... Please put down suggestions below for what e-readers you'd like me to be looking into. Because I need to look at the software I need to get to properly format books. Because I did look at it and there's the formatting for a fiction book. Which is one thing. But then there's the formatting for something which is going to have a lot of pictures. It's going to have this, that, the other. And I'm going to, of course, want to do front covers. And when I'm further along, I might well have a chat with either the person who actually painted this for me for pen and sword because this is available and it looks really really good i have to admit that cover just want to show you what it looks like on an actual book oh, that is a good cover that is a good cover and you know if the seagulls get more detailed you know i just noticed there's this difference between the position of the seagulls here 
and the positions here that he's moved them. Because he knew I wanted three seagulls to represent the three un great uncles who I lost in World War II flying for the fleet air arm. You do. And my family history is not very good. The amount of them that go to World War I and World War II and don't come back. Yes, my family breed like rabbits. <coughs> were very strange for me and my sister, and that were only a two, were, only, were the only two child family. But, um, yeah. We also lost a lot in both world wars. <sighs> but, no, sort of, it's a case of it's may go to him, might go to the very nice gentleman who designed all the. Uh, if I pull it up, these things for me. So. I'm going to see what I'm doing when I get there. I'm going out when I've got the four books ready, etc. Plus, we've got trips this year as well, and not just a big ones, but also I want to do some around the UK. I want to go to various archives, and I'd love to do some meetups when I'm there. If people would want to get together and say hello, I'm always happy to pick a place. I have to admit, I do know where I'd be getting together in Newcastle. I, I'm sorry if this is going to. Um, upset anyone, but there is a very specific pizza place in Newcastle I like. So, if it's Newcastle, it'll be Punk Pizza. I'm sorry, it will be. Because I can get Haggis Pizza and Iron Brew there. I'm happy. A.K.A. Pizza Punks. But I was was called Punk Pizza for some reason. It, it confuses people, but it's me. Joy of Dyslexia. But no, seriously, all those things going on, and none of this will be possible without your support. None of this possible planning this far ahead or anything like that will be possible without your support. So thank you very much to everyone who watches the channel, who subscribes to the channel, who's a member of the channel, who's a patron, who buys stuff from the Spreadshirt store, who buys this book from wherever. Um, there's an Amazon link down below, but... I have that in because that works for everyone, no matter where they are. If you're in the UK, buying it from Pen and Sword is usually cheaper. If you're in the US, buying it from US and I, it tends to be cheaper. Brain had a complete thing then. So, what I'm trying to do into the actual class: the Aphis B, Kesakela, Chuck, a Cockchafer, Cricket. Glowworm, Gnat, Ladybird, Mantis, Moth, Scarab, and Tarantula. Of the insect class. You'll see a lot of these for a world part of World War II as well as World War I. You'll also see that Cockchafer is another name for Maybug. I am just getting that out there at the beginning. Because I know that there are going to be some of you. Some of you. Who are giggling at the name Cockchafer. And it's it's kind of like those stories about people who didn't want to serve aboard a ship called HMS Pansy. People don't giggle at the Cockchafer. And people wanted to serve and were happy to serve on the HMS Pansy. They had done so beforehand and they had, will do so afterwards. Amazingly, the people... In the 1920s and 30s and 1910s and etc. and 1940s were far more mature than some of the people today who find these things humorous. But I can see them. Why do they call them the insect class? Well, to an extent. They're also called the Large China Gunboats. And that tells you where they're coming from. Because there's also the Fly Class, which are the Small China Gunboats. Or the Tigris Gunboat Flotilla. Which were designed at the same time. Those vessels included Black Fly, Caddis Fly, Dragon Fly, Gad Fly, Green Fly, May Fly, Sedge Fly, Stone Fly, Butterfly, Crane Fly, Fire Fly, Grey Fly, Hover Fly, Sail Fly, Snake Fly and Water Fly. Those vessels all seem to be out of service by 1924, although some did serve with the British Army between 1918 and 1924, the most had left the Royal Navy by 1918. One of them, Firefly, was actually captured at one point by the Ottomans, but 
tarantula recaptured her. They sent a tarantula to catch a, catch a fly. How appropriate. It was Firefly. And they were all built for the Tigris River uh, campaign and the various campaigns in Mesopotamia because it was lessons of, well, I suppose, for one, uh, one, uh, for want of a better phrase, of Egypt, of the Gordon campaign, of the Nile campaign. Of go knowing that the major transport, the major movement of goods is going to be along a river. If you've watched what happened in America during the Civil War and various other things like that, if you're going to be fighting along the river, you're going to need gunboats. Now, why would I call the large China and small China gunboats? Because, believe it or not, the Yangtze, etc., you need gunboats wandering up and down. They were a big part of the presence. And so that's a good cover for them. Now... One of the things I often get asked, discussions, that come up is where do gunboats, etc., fit in the treaties? And it's the thing is they fit in the same category as sloops because they are less than 2,000 tons. They can't do 20, more than 20 knots. And they carry no torpedoes. So no one takes an area on free ground. Honestly, at their weight, they're almost, almost light enough that no one would take notice of them, even if they did carry torpedoes. And even if they could go faster than 20 knots, no one would take any notice of them. Their weaponry does get modified as time goes on. In fact, by World War II, many of them were carrying pom-poms, many of them had a 3-inch anti-aircraft gun fitted instead of one of the 6-inch guns. And they had various 20 millimeter cannon added on. They had no armor. Officially. Unofficially, whatever you could get to fit on your ship and it not sink, you took. It's quite simple. Whatever you could get, you took. And, for example, in 1939... The Mark 7 guns from Aphis and Ladybird were replaced by the Mark 13 guns, that's 45 cal guns being replaced with 50 cal guns, from HMS Argencourt, which of course had been decommissioned about 20 years previously. These were the vessels which wandered around. They were presence on distant stations where you wanted to have something get really far upriver and really close to people. This is the Royal Navy. You don't have helicopters. And remember, the presence mission today, it tends to be maximized by a helicopter. You will have people suddenly, little parties of naval personnel appear in a village far inland and go hello, we're here to help and do some work. And they get back in a helicopter and they appear in another village and go hello, we're here to help, how are you doing today? And do some work. And they disappear again. And the point is made, all very friendly, but they can put little parties of people wherever they need to. Well, this is your example. You're far from the Royal Navy, you're safe in shore. Hello, we're here to help. What can we do today? It works. Now. They are well armed, well proportioned and well designed for this stuff. But they are not vessels you want to take on rough seas. Which will explain quite a lot of their deployments, and also why they get send to get stuck places, because you really don't want to take them anywhere else. Although Tarantula not only captured Firefly in her life, she also at one point was the flagship of the British Pacific Fleet. 
You gotta love that for a turn up for the books for a little gunboat. The Mesopotamia campaign. Why this class was sort of built. Sort of built. Because they do one in 1914. And it really doesn't go as well as it could do. Why do I say it doesn't go as well as it could do? Uh... The British Indian Expeditionary Force, comprising of the 6th Poonar Division, led by Lieutenant General Arthur Barrett, with Sir Percy Cox as political officer, opposed by 350 Ottoman troops and four, gu and four guns, managed to overrun the fort at Fowl. By mid November, the Poonar Division was fully ashore and had begun moving towards Basra. Same month, Sheikh Mubarak al Sabah, the ruler of Kuwait, sent forces to attack Ottoman troops at Umm Qasar, Safwan, Bujian, and Basra. As a result, the British recognised Kuwait as an independent government under British protection. The Ottomans held the ground and then retreated a few weeks afterwards. All this really did was stop the completion of the Baghdad Railway, which helped the British prevent the, per uh, prevent the Ottoman and German reinforcement reaching the Persian Gulf. But, pretty much, the British stop when they reach Basra. Because whilst the Ottoman troops had abandoned Basra, it was very different once you went further north and head f headed for Baghdad. In 1915, especially towards the end of it, this will start turning up. And they're really there by 1916. And in 1916, they are giving it a lot of fun. As they suddenly make these campaigns far more possible. And slowly, you get the movements up the rivers. And eventually, you get the movements towards Kut, etc., and all these are supported by the insect class gunboats and the fly class gunboats. Without them, they couldn't move up. And frankly, most of the advance is dependent upon the fire support of those vessels, which was the mobile firepower. Remember, you don't have artillery that moves on, you can fire on a move here. You have towed guns, which you turn a position and then start firing. In contrast, the ship can move up and can fire as it's moving, quite possibly. Not necessarily the most accurate like, Let's be honest, these are not exactly that big. And if you want an example of a oce more oceanic gunboat, please go and have a look at M33. And have a look at the video about M33 on this channel. She's a beautiful example of the gunboats built in the period. Built to a different design than this class, but very similar in emphasis. And yet, that is their purpose, to give fire support. But they're not necessarily the most accurate in terms of moving. But there again, you're not a moving target, usually on land. You're usually a stationary position, like a fort or guns themselves which are being put down, whereas this is maybe moving. It all works. It works out. Ah, Aphis. Built by Alisa Shipbuilding Company. Operated on Danube in 1917. Then spent most of her life on the China Station. Battle honours include Mediterranean 1940 to 45, Libya 1940 to 42, 
Sicily 1943, Adriatic 1944, Southern France 1944. Did well. B. Well, she was sold for scrap on the 22nd of March 1939. She was scrapped because she'd been replaced by the Scorpion, which was a new gunboat constructed by the Royal Navy in 1938. This gunboat, HMS Scorpion, would be sunk on the 13th of February 1941, I think? No, 1942. Um, by the Japanese cruiser Yura and destroyers Fubuki and Asagari. Why have I written 1941 on that? My notes are terrible. Sorry. And, of course, as I said, B was scrapped. She was sold in Shanghai for scrap on 22nd of March 1939 for £5,225. It would have been so much more useful if she'd been brought home, but hindsight. And then there's HMS Cockchafer, which I've lost my notes on, hopefully. Now, she gets honours for Sicily 1943, Medtrain 1940 to 45, built by Barclay Curl. Takes part in the Wanhisian incident um, between August and September 1926, known, uh, known as the Wanzhou district. For another planning incident. It was about 1,500 miles upstream from Shanghai. The local warlord, the Marshal Wu Pei Fu, controlled the area, and his local commander was a General Yan Sen. General Yang's troops decided to seize the SS Wanxian, a British ship merchant ship, which belonged to the China Navigation Company, owned by the Swa Group. This is one of those interesting groups which, as I said before, own some very interesting ships. The vessel at the incident at the centre of the Singtao incident, which I've done some videos on, is another of those vessels which are owned by interesting groups, which means it's it's probably British, and the British presume on acting like it's British, but its ownership is vague enough, no one's quite sure who exactly what or owns uh, when, what owns it. Unfortunately for General Yang, the cockchafer was not moored that far away, and heard the British crew calling for help, and so sent an officer and a boarding party aboard to investigate. They found the ship occupied by a hundred Chinese soldiers, which the Navy then obtained the release of the ship after a heated argument, which certainly did not involve at any point someone pointing out to the fact that there was a vessel which had six-inch guns and machine guns pointed at them not very far away, and they were on the open deck of a merchant ship, which was not that big. No one at any point pointed that out to them. It's a problem with the diplomacy. Might can sometimes make right. It shouldn't do. It can do, though. On 26th of August 1926, uh, another China Navigation Company ship, the SS Wanlu, and there is definitely some reason to believe that... Um, um, General Yang uh, wanted more money from the China Navigation Company. I'm fairly certain, although it's never officially described, that the CNC provided various backhanders to certain lords to you know, allow, enable them to trade, etc. in certain areas. It was all tax, etc. They wanted to perhaps have 
more money than the marshal was supposed to was actually supposed to be allowing in his area, uh, potentially to allow him to actually challenge the marshal for control. Having extra money allows you to hire and train more troops. It's always useful. Buy more equipment, stockpile it all, so you can become the new big dictator and seem to be doing trying to do a shakedown of the various western trading companies and please don't get us the wrong way this is a story as old as humanity there have been humans doing something similar for a long long time the fact that it occurs so often it's sort of practically a pastiche of itself is neither here nor there 29th of August, 1926. The Wanlu makes a sudden U-turn while a wooden boat full of Chinese soldiers, guns, bullets and allowances, passes by. The wave caused the Wanlu, caused by the Wanlu, to capsize the wooden boat. 58 soldiers were drowned. All the ammunition, guns... Some of the allowances were lost. They did recover some of the soldiers. And those soldiers then attempted to capture the ship. I can again understand the reason why. Oh, you, you turned. You caused all our friends to be killed. All this sort of stuff. I can understand that. But probably not the most sensible thing, as the Wanlu had been, they'd been unable to seize control of the ship by the time the Wanlu reached Wanxian, where Kok Chofer immediately sent a boarding party aboard to remove the soldiers. Again, without looking at the ship armed with six inch guns, looking at them going, Really? This caused General Yang to react again. So he seized the one he's seen again. And Hell managed to capture the British officers aboard and hold them aboard. Also, the Wang Tung, another British ship, was captured. Chinese troops gathered artillery on the shore. Yang then seized several ch ch cock chafers, Chinese crew members who were ashore. And one was killed within full view of the rest of the crew. He refused to negotiate the commander of Chok Ch a Kok Chafer. And the senior officer on the upper Yangtze, commander of Wigjun, headed for Wansin, while Kok Chafer remained in the sound of the Chinese troops. Wigjun arrived. Negotiations did not go well. And so the rear admiral decided to settle matters by force. They took a British merchant ship, the SS Coral. They camouflaged and armoured it and manned a naval crew with a naval crew gathered from Cockchafer and a light cruiser dispatch, as well as some from Scarab and Mantis, Cockchafer's sisters, and boarded Quail, and she sailed on the 4th of September 1926. On the 5th of September, she arrived in sight of Wansian, the plan was to board and apparently retake Wan Xian and Wang Tong while Wijin and Kokchev provided covering fire. Guo came under fire from the Chinese troops ashore. She came alongside Wan Xian and boarded under fire. The boarding party rescued the British seamen held on board after fierce fighting. Chinese troops decided to open fire on Wang Tong. Open fire uh, on shore, and also those aboard Wang Tong opened fire on Cockchafer and Winston returned fire. Um, Wan Xian, the boarding party, suffered a number of casualties, including senior British officer from dispatch and Cockchafer sub lieutenant who were killed. They rescued the British seamen, though, at which point the attacking force retired to Koal. After an hour of fighting, and this is the problem with when you have to get fighting. Sometimes your bluff is called. Action was discontinued and then retired, having rescued the crews, but lost the ships. 
They also left behind them nearly a thousand Chinese civilians and soldiers dead in the Wanxian incidents. Thousands of shops and homes were destroyed by shells. And General Yang was pressured to release Wanxian and Wantong. It's unclear whether the British paid any compensation, but it's also clear that um, he might not well have been acting with the full support or even knowledge of Marshal Wu Pei Fu. And possibly the compensation went to the Marshal, who then kept his subordinate in hand. And then we have HMS Cricket, which is this one. Yes, she is in her full... No, this one, yeah. Sorry. In her, you know, postcard, and looking at her sort of firing at a Zeppelin airship, which you're supposed to do at some point, but please, I, I do not think firing that six-inch gun at a Zeppelin airship would ever have actually hit anything. And for those who aren't sure, Cricket is the one at the top. That is Aphis coming towards me, and that is B. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Cricket had fun. She also took part in the Mesopotamia campaign and the Russian Civil War. And during the Second World War, she started off in China until 1940, then transferred to the Mediterranean Fleet's inshore squadron. In 1941, she was crippled by an air attack by the Radio Aeronautica. And she's declared a constructive loss on the 30th of June 1942, and stripped for spares. And eventually her hull was towed to Cyprus and used as a target for Royal Air Force training off Tequila. The hull is still there and is an attraction for scuba divers. So if you want to go see the remnants, remnants and please note remnants of an insect class hull, go diving off Cyprus. Be fun. It's nice water to dive in usually off Cyprus. Usually, he says. And they also get to take part in the Panay incident. How? Well... Not only were British gunboats Lady Bird and Bee also attacked, but they managed to get there in time to pick up survivors. And it's literally the American vessel, the Ohau. Ohau? 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 O-A-H-U. Ohau? I'm not sure how to pronounce it at all. And Lady Bird and Bee turned up. Japanese shore battery decides to fire on Ladybird. Ladybird gives them the Ladybird look. Japanese government took full responsibility for it, and full responsibility for the attack on the British. They apologised for both. Vice Admiral Rokuzo Sugiyama was assigned to make an apology. And they took the blame. But it still happened. Yes. They had been attack trying to attack some oil tankers. Although those were standard oil tankers. Mei Ping, Mei An, and Mei Hesi. But, you know. So they're technically the oil tankers are American. They're owned by an American company. They might be supplying oil in China, but they're owned by an American company. And... They attack Panay, which is a US Navy gunboat. Three US flags were plainly visible on the ship. The planes also machine gunned small bo boats, taking the wounded ashore, and several additional survivors were wounded. There was also a Times correspondent aboard the Panay, Colin MacDonald, who saw a Japanese Army small boat machine gun 
uh, machine, uh, small boat machine gunned the Panay as it was sinking, in spite of the American flag painted on the side of the ship. Two newsreel camera were aboard during the attack. Norman Alley of Universal News and Eric Mayle of Movie Tone News. It's just, it's the most high profile thing you could do. It, this is one of those scenarios where there are so many people in this location aboard, you'd almost, you'd want to think it was rigged. Apart from the fact that because of the other incidents and the ongoing stuff going on in, in China at the time, they were attracting attention anyway. And if you're a newspaper person and you want to get far inland at this time, and you're American, well, getting, a, or even British, getting aboard an American or British gunboat to take you up the river is probably the safest way to get there. Because, theoretically, no one should attack you. And it'll allow you to get really close to the fighting. And give you some measure of safe passage. And they won't bother about having you aboard because it's extra company. And you might have information they can use, so it works for all involved. It's not as if a gunboat is unlikely to have anything on that is so secret they don't worry. They're going to worry about you seeing it because the whole purpose of a gunboat is to sail into the middle of, the middle of enemy territory, which means you might lose it, which means you don't put the top of the range stuff aboard it. Now we have Nat, which is this one. Bidet as a China station of 1922. They always look quite so pretty like that. Then we have Ladybird, which this is her picture at Port Said in November 1917. Then we have HMS Moth in her pictured when she was Suma. Another Japanese control. Yes. Moth was captured. And Tarantula. That vessel which did all sorts of weird, strange things. That in her form as repair slash support ship she was serving as offices in uh, in Trim Conway Salon and in 1944 serves as Admiral Bruce Fraser's flagship of the British Pacific Fleet because what he needs he doesn't have any big ships at this point that he can set up his offices aboard so he's got a ship which is entirely office space. And so he's aboard that. <laughs> it's just the case of... And uh, this was in her fighting... No, this was in her later day repair ship slash offices form. She was a flagship. The ship which had retaken a gunboat that had previously been captured by the Ottoman Empire. A ship which had led some of the engagements on the route to Baghdad. And yet, this is what she is by 1946. By 1943, as she's pictured. And actually, in 1946, she's sunk as a gunnery target in the Bay of Bengal. Um, well, late 1946, May 1946. Uh, by HMS Karen and HMS Carrisfoot. Two destroyers. Almost as if Fraser is trying to get rid of the evidence that he had his flagship aboard anything but something which was a premier vessel. No, no, no. I will not admit it. Moth was in dock for repairs after Sakela had been sunk. And when Singapore fell to the Japanese, they scuttled Moth.
Unfortunately, she's then recovered by the Japanese. Life happens. March 19th of March 1945, she struck a naval mine at Anqing and sank with a loss of eight crewmen and never recovered from that. Sad to think that happened on the 19th of March, between set class. Ah, well. HMS Ladybird, well, she was allocated to Singapore in 1940. Then stripped down and towed to the Mediterranean because, well, let's be honest. You don't want to making a, foot, a crossing of Eden, even the Indian Ocean without being lightened and preferably under tow rather than crewed. During the journey, she sustained damage, which meant she was limited to a speed of seven knots because her hull was by this point misaligned. She's therefore used to guard Port Said because at seven knots, she's not really useful for anything else. In January 1941, she bombarded the Italian port of Bardia in, the, in Libya in support of the Allied capture of Bardia as part of Operation Compass. And in February 1941, she landed Royal Marines during Operation Abstention, which was an attempt to try and seize the island of um, Castelrizzo. During this, she's hit by an area bomb. Later, acting in support of the Tobruk garrison, she shelled the Gaza airfield and ferried in supplies. And whilst doing this, on 12th of May 1941, she was severely damaged by dive bombers, set on fire, and settling on an even keel in roughly three metres of water. As it was still above water, her three inch gun was used as an anti aircraft gun, and HMS Nat replaced Lady Bird in supporting Tobruk. Speaking of Nat, Nat takes part in the Mesopotamia campaign and then participated in the Royal Navy Flotilla in the Nanking incident, helping to protect British and other international citizens in China when people were being less than welcoming. It's just terrible. Terrible. Terrible, I say. Um, Nat had a ship's dog from 1936 onwards, which was a, white, uh, a, a purebred liver and white pointer called Judy. I agree with having a ship's dog. I think a corgi or a poodle would be better. I merely mentioned the corgi first because that's slightly smaller and therefore more befitting a gunboat in terms of it could occupy it more successfully because there'd be more places it could get proportionally. Again, she's relieved by HMS Grasshopper. A Dragonfly-class river gunboat built in the 1930s, yes. The Royal Navy built more gunboats in the 1930s. Uh, Dragonfly, Grasshopper, Locust, Mosquito, Scorpion and Bee were all those vessels. Uh, built by Vosperfornicroft, Yara, uh, Yara, Yara, Shipbuilders and J.S. White. Again, good little ships, but four-inch guns on single 40-degree mountings. But yes, you need gunboats. You do need gunboats. I prefer to be building sloops, but you do need gunboats. And so she'd been transferred to the Mediterranean Shore Squadron then. And along with Stuart, Vampire, Voyager and Terra, supported the 6th Australian Division's assault on Tobruk. She was torpedoed on 21st of October 1941 by U-79, yes, the German U-boat, but did not sink, was towed and beached Alexandria and used as a fixed anti-aircraft platform. She declared a constructive total loss and finally scrapped in 1945. But she's basically been a fixed anti-aircraft platform for four years. And can we all please manage to think about what U-79's commander's mind was going when he went, I hit out the torpedo and it didn't sink. 
What is happening with my torpedoes? I, I'm very happy for the crew they live, but there's honestly part of me sitting going, that, that this, this, this does not look like a ship which is supposed to take a torpedo hit and keep on going. It's not. It's not. It's really not. As you might have guessed, most of World War II, they are involved in supporting operations, in providing fire support, in providing the gunnery that helps the Royal Navy do what it needs to do when it needs to do it. Especially when it comes to landing troops. Because they can get close inshore, and therefore they can provide close, supportive, accurate gunnery fire with nice powerful six inch guns which can do a lot of damage this makes them very useful it also makes the fact that some of them were scrapped really after the war had begun and when I say some of them were scrapped after the war had begun Mantis is sold in January 1940 and some of them were scrapped And we've already been over others of the class, which were scrapped. But Glowworm had been scrapped in 1928, which is why a destroyer had been able to be called Glowworm. And, of course, there's B. So that's three of the class. Scrapped. 1940, 1939, and 1928. There are reasons for it, I'm sure, but they would have been really useful. And if we go back to this, it's not as if there are limitations on from them on any of the treaties. But there again, please note, this is my usual point when it comes to treaties. The treaties are restrictive, but they're not as restrictive as they're often made out to be. There are certain vessels and categories you could get away with building in su sufficient numbers. Sloops for anti-submarine warfare. And convoy escorts. You could have built those up prior to World War II very easily. Not had to worry about the, I don't know, the restricted, uh, restriction, uh, restricted number of yards available. You could have built vessels bigger, tougher, with more capabilities than the flare class easily. Uh, you could have built full sloops if you'd been ordering them in sufficient numbers. You could have easily built those prior to World War II. And gunboats as well. And the Royal Navy was building gunboats, but if we consider the Dragonfly class, they lay them down in December 1937 to Dragonfly and Glasshopper and Scorpion. B is cancelled in March 1940. Of course, there's. Now, this is why in March 1940, it doesn't look at all like you're going to have to do any inshore amph amphibious support or fire support. Uh, Mosquito is and Locust are laid down in November 1938. Dragonfly, Grasshopper, and Scorpion are all lost at Banker Strait in 30 February and 14 February 1942. This is Island of um, Java in the. In, uh, in, in in Indonesia. Locust survives World War II. Mosquito is sunk off Dunkirk in June 1940. They were ships which could have been very useful. And that's really a problem. It's not nice to speak ill of the dead. But it's also important to remember that even the people who were asking serious questions about the fence spending in the 1920s and 1930s were concentrating on the headline units. They were concentrating on carriers, on battleships, on cruisers. 
destroyers occasionally came up, usually in terms of numbers, not in terms of capabilities, and certainly vessels below that didn't get any attention. In World War I, these were the vessels which had had to be surge constructed. And the lesson of Model 1 was that if you were building them in, at, in the last minute, you were going to get as cheap as chips, bare basic capabilities. Which were going to be useful. They, they provide a lot of avenues for advancement and development. But honestly, you want something slightly better than that, especially if you're building in peacetime. And the thing is, they could have taken their time. They could have kept churning out some every year. If you take sloops and gunboats, for example, and you say, right then, I want to build a 700 tons gunboat every year. At least a couple of them. They're not limited by the treaty in any way. Shape or form, me churning out China Station gunboats a couple of year is not going to make anyone upset or worried. Might annoy the Japanese a little bit, but doubtful and enjoy them that much because they really won't worry about them. Because they're only really useful in the sort of operations which, once we get into, they're not going to have any. Or rather, we're already in such a war that, frankly, they're not going to worry about that. And the same goes for sloops. Because the first thing I'd have been thinking, especially if I'd been the government at the time, thinking about Far East war plans, etc. Which was what the British were thinking about in the 1920s and 30s. We can build these ships. The more ships we have that are doing, able to do this, the more destroyers we can free up to go with the fleet. And yes, it might be we're freeing up second-rate destroyers, World War One V&W destroyers, to go and do these operations of all those, but as those are extra destroyers. And the point is, at a certain point, destroyers are destroyers. Yes! A V&W is nowhere near the same combat unit capability as an H-Class, or definitely not a Tribal or a J-Class, or something like that. But, properly maintained, it still carries torpedoes, it still has the speed, it still has the capabilities, it's still a destroyer. And you can only build so many of those. So they're useful. And especially because you don't want to have to rapidly change them all and commit to one thing at a time. You want to keep those vessels free up. Because again, if they're older vessels, they're older vessels. But if you can deploy enough of them, they're going to have a value. They're going to provide you a quantity. So things like gunboats, things like sloops, they are force multipliers because they take on the lower threat, they take on the specific roles of anti-submarine warfare in the case of the sloops, of inshore support, river work, in the case of gunboats, from these ships, which frees them up to do the things you need them to do, their capabilities specifically to do. And they're not restricted. So, Normally, I come with a question, and this one's going to be a fun one, because it's Christmas, New Year period, it's now New Year when this comes out. I want you to look up insect names, and I want to hear what your suggestions would be for their... Well, as you can see, the class gets 12 names. 2, 4, 6, 8... Yeah. Sorry, mentally through my head was going 10. I was going, I know that's not the right number, so I'm not going to say that. I have to check. So I'd like to hear what you think the next six should have been named in terms of insects. I'd love to hear that. Right. Thank you very much for watching, as you can see. This is what we've got coming up, and I know I should have underlined all the ones that will be done by the point this comes out, but yeah, you've got tomorrow top five inventions that came too early, and on Saturday top five inventions that came too late to be sold. Hope you enjoy. Take care.